American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my head tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down, like blues on Tuesdays come down. Throw it all away. Welcome to another episode of American, American Timelines. Time. I am a very husky-voiced Amy. Yes, this is my very rough and tumble wife, Amy, and my name is Joe, and this is episode 180 wow. of American Timelines. That's insane. By History for Jerks. Yeah, 180, 180 episodes. <laughs> I kept it going when you quit. I know. Um, and we are into a new year. We are in 1955. So yes. we're halfway through the season. Or we're getting after this one. We'll be ha- or halfway through this year. We'll be halfway through the season, mm-hmm. season five, and mm-hmm. then we'll switch it up and make it more exciting for everybody. Yes. But we went ahead and planned ahead this time, Amy and I, and she is only going to miss one episode of this year. Yes. Of 1955. Hopefully. And, and the plan is to do two months an episode. So I'm going to gloss over some things. I don't have to talk about every plane crash. I don't have to talk about every fucking birthday. So let's get into it. <laughs> so we'll get into it. So as we do, as you all know, uh, when we have a new year, there's a lot of things right. that I find that don't have date specific, but they have year specific. Things. Right. So I'm going to cover those at the top. Okay, doke. You ready for these? I'm ready. So there, Chrysler made a car for women. Did you know that? Oh, in my 1955? God. You're kidding. The La Femme stemmed from the observation That's of Chrysler's- That's a terrible idea. Because w- <laughs> nobody can borrow your car if they're not- Like, especially back those days- Like the pink Cadillacs and stuff? They have those. Like, I know, but back in those days, a man wouldn't be able to borrow your car- He wouldn't want to. Wouldn't want to. Or if he did, maybe that's his subtle way of coming out. Uh, But this stemmed from the observation of Chrysler's marketing department that more women were taking an interest in automobiles during the 50s and that women's opinions on which color car to buy was becoming part of the decision-making process for couples buying cars. Mm -hmm. The La Femme was an attempt to gain a foothold in the women's automobile market. It was based upon two Chrysler show cars from the 54 season named La Comte and La Comtesse. Each was built from a Chrysler Newport hardtop body mm-hmm. and was given a clear plastic roof over the entire passenger compartment. While the La Comte, Comte was designed using masculine colors, the La Comtesse was painted dusty rose and pigeon gray in oh order to gosh. convey femininity. I bet they were great. I bet they, like I would probably... So, I got to look it up. Yeah, look it up because I was going to tell you. I would I probably thought, love I to right drive away, one. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought you'd have a different response. You would, you want this car now because let me tell you what else it comes with. Wait a minute. How do you spell it? Uh, the La Femme is L A F E M M E. So Dodge received, car. received this project based on these other ones and, and renamed the concept La Femme, which began as a 1955. Oh yes, I Dodge would love those custom Royal Lancer Spring Special Hardtop Two Door Coupe painted sapphire white and heather rose is what you're looking at. Um, mm-hmm. So if you look this up, look up La Femme. You can just image search it. It is like a cool 50s pink. It matches Amy's whole yeah thing. Like you belong in this car. Oh, this is cute. Uh, <laughs> uh, the interior of the car also received attention and features. The uh, it had uh, a special tapestry material in the upholstery featuring pink rosebuds on a <laughs> pale silver pink background and a pale pink vinyl trim. The La Femme came with a uh, keystone shaped pink calfskin purse that coordinated with the interior of the car, so your purse matches your car. The purse could be stowed in a compartment in the back of the passenger seat, and its gold plated medallion faced outward. This brushed metal medallion was large enough to have the owner's name engraved on it. So, oh, nice. Like the way you set your purse, it just, just has your name just engraved in the little thing. And then each purse was outfitted with a coordinated set of accessories inside, which included a face powder compact, oh my lipstick gosh. case, cigarette case, comb, cigarette lighter, and change purse, all made of either faux tortoiseshell plastic and gold toned metal 
or pink cast. God, to go back metal. in time just to <laughs> this was buy one of these brand new cars with all those with all things, the accessories, all those accessories. Like, oh I was, my gosh! When I was reading this whole thing, I was like, "You need one of these." I know. Somehow. I would yeah. love that. I wonder if we could somehow get one. So uh, there's got to be somewhere a museum or somewhere or some way to yeah. Um, Anyway, all of those things, those accessories were designed by Evans, a maker of women's fine garments and accessories in Chicago. Oh, nice. Can you hear all that in the background? A little bit. That's our dog exploring the garage. That's fine. Who cares? Who cares? Nobody cares. Um, oh, also on the back of the driver's seat, there was a compartment that contained... A raincoat, a rain bonnet, an umbrella, oh my all made from a vinyl pattern to match the rosebud interior. Oh my fabric. gosh! I knew you were gonna love it. Yeah, I love it. Uh, the marketing brochure said the car was made by special appointment to Her Majesty, the American woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you. Yes, I was looking at the interior. It was looking pretty nice too. Yeah, wasn't that cool? That's what like I was talking. About. All that's in stuff. the interior. Yeah, uh, and to go along with this, um, I don't know if you know this, but Marlboro was a lady cigarette before. Oh, when it like, first started? It, when they first did it, their whole slogan was premium lady cigarettes, Marlboro was. Mild as May was their thing. Okay. And they only showed women, like in the 30s and stuff, they just showed women. But in 1955, they changed their ads to oh, cowboys. And the Marlboro and, Man. And Marlboro Country images. Yeah, Marlboro Man and stuff. And their sales increased 3,241% in one year. Wow. When they started appealing to cowboys. Uh, And speaking of cigarettes, did you know that in 1955, cigarettes were sold in vending machines? Mm -hmm. uh, And uh, because those machines only accepted quarters and cigarettes at that time cost 23 cents, not 25. Yeah. So cigarette manufacturers started putting two pennies in the package oh, of cigarettes. Funny. So when you bought your cigarettes, there would be two pennies in the packaging. Uh, oh, that's very funny. And according to PCG, <coughs> PCGS.com, <coughs> which seems to be like a collector's site or something, apparently there's a bunch of rare pennies mm-hmm. that were minted weirdly or something, so they're worth a ton, and they were only put in cigarettes. Like, you could only get them in those cigarettes. So oh, my gosh. Somewhere somebody has an unopened package of yeah. those cigarettes with, with two, the pennies in it. two of those special minted pennies or whatever, uh, and they're probably worth billions, and they don't even know it. I don't know about billions. I think that's a little hyperbole. Actually, oh, no, actually, that looking it up here, yeah, let me uh, verify this. Oh, kajillions, I think. No. Yeah, I think it's kajillions. It might be. And now, since we're talking about Ladies and cigarettes. Yes. It's only natural to start talking about alcohol. Okay. According to medium.com, in 1955, I don't know if you know, but Jack Daniels wasn't the liquor powerhouse we think of today. It was around, but it wasn't as big of a deal. Uh, It was not the best-selling whiskey in the world, even though the distillery was nearly 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Um the Lynchburg Company was still a small regional br- brand out of Tennessee. Um, roughly 150,000 cases annually of its black label Tennessee whiskey would sell. But by the end of 1956, however, that figure had doubled because of something that happened in 1955. In fact, a shortage uh, happened in 1956 because it be- got so popular. Okay. You want to know what changed? Like what? Yeah. I don't know. An I'm endorsement. Not- they got an endorsement from someone. Who do you think? That friend was Frank Sinatra. Okay. I was going to say John Wayne. He was a dedicated whiskey drinker who took his jack on three rocks with two fingers and just a splash of water. As Jack Daniels' master distiller Jeff Arnett recounts, 1955 was the year that Sinatra brought a rocks glass on stage with him and uttered this magical line. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Daniels, and it's the nectar of the gods. That's my impression. I, was, I my would head. stick with your regular voice. It's the nectar of the gods. Yeah. Steve, kick his ass. No, I'd stick with I your regular voice. I got chunks of guys like you in my stool. I knew that was coming. All right, that's Phil Hartman's. That's me doing Phil Hartman doing Frank Sinatra. Right. Anyway. But, yeah, uh, Frank Sinatra said, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Daniels, and it's the nectar of the gods. And then everybody loves Frank Sinatra, so everybody started buying it. Um, and... 
it, brand ambassadors didn't really exist then, so this is mm. kind of maybe the first brand ambassador. So without a contract or a paycheck or any official partnership, Old Blue Eyes had a measurable impact on the whiskey of choice simply by being the coolest guy in the room and telling his fans that he liked it. Uh, so he literally took Jack Daniels from being a small regional brand to being a household name. Uh, wow. In exchange, Jack Daniels made sure his glass was never empty. I was going to say, yeah, they, they gave him life, probably life everywhere he went. They even they had a guy. Uh, probably that was his only job. Angelo Lucchesi, his job was just to keep Frank Sinatra Drunk. stocked. <laughs> everywhere they went, they would send a case of Jack Daniels, make oh sure God. he always had a case. Jeez, uh, isn't that a crazy? Case. In his dressing room, everywhere he went. Lord, so, you know he's just hammered. God. Yeah. And that some of that, I feel, well, he was feel probably like, a, one of those alcoholics that's like doesn't get drunk anymore. Yeah, just always drunk. Yeah, probably like, wakes up and has it, but until he's got his drink, you know he's got to feel like shit. Yeah, until he oh, gets that first drink at yes. five a.m. or six a.m. or whatever he gets up. Yeah, I can't imagine. But so somebody like that, you know, do they even have a shot? Like, right? Do you have a shot of not being an alcoholic if you're that big and that famous and like the drink, like? Everybody gives you whatever what you, you want. want. You put That's it right, right in your hand. You yeah. Know? Anybody who's like f- big and famous can. Well, just working with touring group, you know, touring mm. bands all the time. I see writers all the time that always want bullet whiskey and bullet. You know, if you think about it, every single city they go to, they get a jar. You know, they get a a bottle of Jack Daniels. I got a fresh bottle last night. I got another one tonight. You know, it stocks up. Yeah. Right. A lot of times it's the crew that's drinking it, probably more than them anyway. But but they have tons of alcohol. Yeah. And they just, and it's sad. And you see a lot of these people who are just functioning alcoholics. Anyway, the TV remote control and the microwave oven were introduced in 1955. Ooh. The future is here. Did you know that in Back to the Future, that's when Marty goes back to 1955? Mm-hmm. And he plays a guitar, uh, and that's a Gibson ES-345. And guitar nerds will tell you that's not accurate because that wasn't created until 1958. So Back to the Future is not true. It's oh, not my true God. Um, what are we going to do? Another thing that happened sometime in 1955 that we can't really find the exact date for was that um, Velcro was patented. Thank God. But do you you know, know how much Velcro I use in my job? Velcro is your thing. Well, here's a little story you can tell about it now. Do you know how they figured out Velcro? Yes. Like, how? Looking at the burr. You do know that? How do yeah. you know that? I'm smart. It smells like dog poop. Well, our dogs were just on top of you, and they probably got dingleberries. And now, where's the little one? I don't know, but it smells like dog poop all of a sudden to me. You probably take a shit somewhere. Oof. You don't smell that? No, and I usually smell everything. I know. Okay, in, 19, in 1941, Swiss engineer George de Mestrel was on a hunting trip and noticed that both his pants and his Irish pointer's hair were covered in the burrs from burdock plant. Where many might have brushed them off in irritation, de Mestrel decided to study the burrs under a microscope, more out of curiosity than sensing a new business opportunity. However, what he saw were thousands of tiny hooks that efficiently bound themselves to nearly any fabric or dog hair that passed by. Anyway, he figured out, this is when he figured out to make Velcro. And yes, he, and it's, it, it is. From 41 all the way to 55, it took him that long to figure it out. But actually, even when he made it, nobody mm-hmm. gave a shat, a shat. Nobody gave a shat? Nobody gave a shat. Nobody <laughs> gave a shit. Everybody's like, ah, oh, so what? That's stupid. We don't need it. Yeah. But NASA came along, oh. and they were looking for a way to keep objects attached to walls while floating in orbit. Mm-hmm. So they discovered the, the Velcro brand fastener systems, mm-hmm. and Demestral's invention was no longer an oddity. Uh, it was pretty cool. And then it began to show up in clothing in the mid-60s, including high fashion French fashion designers. Velcro and high yeah. fashion. Yeah, it really was. Was it? Now it's for, uh, what, white trash? Poor people? What, with the shoes? Yeah, the shoes. I had Velcro shoes when I was a kid. I did too. I loved them. Ruse, remember Ruse? Yeah. Weren't those Velcro? They were had a pocket. Oh, they had a pocket. The Velcro ones were- They could be Velcro though too. Um, I can't remember the names. I don't know. In 1955, Pennsylvania set a goal of having a state park- Within 25 miles of every citizen. So Quaker Oats bought 19 acres of land in the Yukon and divided into 21 million one square inch parcels and sold the deeds as an advertising promotion. Ten years later, however, all of it was repossessed by Canada due to a $37 
$37.20 in unpaid back taxes. Oh. That's weird. Yeah, that is weird. Also, did you know that Eggo waffles were originally called froffles? No. In 1953. How is that spelled? F-R-O-F-F-L-E-S. Okay. It sounds dirty, doesn't it? Froffles? Froffles. Yeah. No. It reminds me of felching or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, but in 1953, they were called froffles, but they had to change it to 1955 because they got so much feedback about their eggy taste. That's how they got the name Oh, Ego. the name Ego. Yeah. yeah. Women's, I love Egos. Do you love Ego yes. waffles? I want some right now. I'm starving. Is, is it any different than a regular waffle? Yes. It is it tastes like eggs. You taste no, eggs? it's it's no. I don't taste eggs. It's it's um, I don't know. It's soft and buttery, kind of. I don't know. Wow, you're getting hungry. I'm starving. Women's football, which is soccer, was banned yeah. in West Germany in Why? 1955 for 15 years. Why? Because the combative sport is fundamentally foreign to the nature of women. The body and soul would inevitably suffer damage, and the display of the body violates etiquette and decency. Oh, God. Isn't that crazy? Yes. This is dumb. Don't you hate that? Um, are you familiar with Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita? Um, somewhat. I mean, no. I mean, I know of it. Let's put it that way. You know there's controversy around it? No. Oh, okay, so you don't really know of it. Uh <laughs> not not judging it. I didn't know it. But I thought I was asking because I assume everybody knows. Oh, I'm right. just a dumb guy who doesn't know. Yeah. Because I don't know anything. But it was uh, published in 1955. And this is notable because uh, it, there's controversy. Right? U.S. publishers were initially reluctant to, to associate themselves with such a controversial work. Uh, it's a novel written by Russian-American novelist Vladimir Nabokov. Uh-huh. The the novel is notable for its controversial subject, the, protag- the protagonist and unreliable narrator, a French middle-aged literature professor under the pseudonym Humbert, is obsessed with an American 12-year-old girl. Ew. Yeah, and Dolores Hayes is her name, whom he sexually molests oh, after no. he becomes her stepfather. Oh, no. Yes, gross. So Lolita is his private nickname for Dolores. The novel was originally written in English and first published in Paris in 1955. He's the protagonist? Yes. And later it was translated into Russian by Nabokov himself and published in New York City in 1967 by Phaedra Publishers. But it was adapted to a film by Stanley Kubrick in 62, another film by Adrian Lin in 1997. It's also been adapted several times for the stage. It's been the subject of two operas, two ballets, and an acclaimed but commercially unsuccessful Broadway musical. It's been included in several lists of best books, such as Time's List of the 100 Best Novels, Le Mans' 100 Books of the Century. Oh, my God. All right. We get the point. All this stuff. So, yeah. But the novel continues to generate controversy today as modern society has become increasingly aware of the lasting damage created by child sexual abuse. Yes. Hello. It's just weird. I, I had no idea that sexual abuse like this and was like almost celebrated and accepted. And called yeah. It. Reminds me of the whole Brooke Shields thing we got all upset about. Yeah. Like that's, that's not right. You no, know, it's like, what is going on in our world? Oh my God. I just read this article about how um, evangelicals in the evangelical church, there's a lot of sex abuse that is covered up Oh my gosh. because it's so patriarchal and in the, you, the pastors are like considered, to be chosen by God. Yeah, so, so whatever, whatever they, they do, is, do okay. is okay. If they do that, then oh well, God uh, must yeah. want my kid to be. Right? That's and awful. and and the victims are blamed like you shouldn't have tempted. <sighs> and then and then the other piece of it is that the abusers can repent, quote unquote. Uh-huh. And then they get access to children end up again. doing five more kids. Uh, yeah, it's it, it was bad. It's crazy how religion can really I mean, religion not, all, is, not all religion is bad. No. I mean, there are people who have great lives and religion is great and they're great people, but it's amazing how much it can be used as a tool to abuse. I know, and well, it's a control. It's a, it's a method of controlling. It's people. so sad. Yeah, it's it sad is. and scary. Well, in two thousand eight, an entire book was published on the best ways to teach this novel. 
We're in still the, talking in, about this in a college classroom. Well, yeah, because I had to know. Like, yeah, there's got to be somebody who's saying this is wrong, right? So, in 2008, an entire book was published on the best ways to teach the novel in college classrooms. Given that it's got this particular mix of narrative strategies, ornate, elusive prose, and troublesome subject matter, uh, it complicates its presentation to students. That's right, quote, obviously, um, because it is. I mean, that's the hard thing about literature is like. It could be well written. It could be well done. It could have right. value, mm-hmm. despite, despite the fact its that, subject so it, matter. It gets into this weird subject of mm-hmm. about artists and art, and you know, it kind of is parallel to the whole Michael Jackson thing. Like, can you separate the artist from the art? And can I still like Michael Jackson songs, even though he may have abused everyone, even though we don't know? But anyway, in this book, one author urges teachers to note that Dolores's suffering is noted in the book. Mm-hmm. Even if the main focus is on Humbert, so at least they they acknowledge that she suffered by this and was abused. I mm-hmm. guess I haven't read it, but that's what they say. Um, but many critics describe Humbert obviously as a rapist and things like that. But there was somebody mentioned. I, I was excited about this because in Wikipedia, this is the first time I've ever come across uh, somebody uh, referencing a podcast as a reference. I couldn't believe oh. it. So. And at the end of this whole thing, it says, In 2020, a podcast hosted by Jamie Loftus set out to examine the cultural legacy of the novel and argued that depictions and adaptations have twisted Nabokov's original intention of condemning Humbert and Lolita. So I didn't listen to that podcast. I've never heard of that podcast, but just the fact that a podcast mm-hmm. is referenced, I'm all for that. Um, but, yeah, it's now I know what that book is. Lolita, I didn't have any idea. Um all right, we're starting to get into January here, but as a young journalist, I don't know if you know this, in 1955, Dan Rather did heroin once in 1955 and documented his experience. Oh. Uh, and he explained his full story during a 2012 interview with Business Insider. Uh, Dan Rather said, I knew a lot of police officers. They said they had arrested these people for heroin. I had no idea what it was. The police described it to me best as they knew from what people told them, so I said it'd be a good story to get some heroin so I had no idea how to get it, and then describe how you feel. So I did that with the help of the police and the police station. Hard to imagine these days, but I knew these guys pretty well, so they injected me at the police station, and I made notes as best I could have on what the effects were. As we produced a series of This Is What Heroin Is, oh, and we produced a series of This Is What Heroin Is, This Is Why People Take It, This Is What You Experience While You're Under the Influence, This Is Why It's Dangerous. Yeah. Okay. I never knew that Dan yeah, Rather did heroin, that. so that's something. Was Dan Rather the, what's the frequency, Kenneth? Yes. Okay. That was Dan I Rather. couldn't remember. He's the CBS guy. He yeah. was on CBS for years. That's right. Um, I don't know if you know this. Have you ever heard of the movie The Conqueror? No. It was filmed in 1955, and John Wayne, Susan Hayward, Lee Van Cleef, Agnes Moorhead, and Dick Powell all ran it, and they all eventually died of cancer. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think from filming this film near a Nevada nuclear testing site. Hmm. Of the 220 film crew members, 91 developed cancer during their lifetime, Mm, while 46 died from it. Uh, Now, a lot of people say, oh, that's a high number, but it's actually, it's right along the average. Oh, it just sounds high. So it just sounds high, and so it it does. That's sad. That's the average. Well, I guess we're all going to end up with cancer if something else doesn't kill us first. I guess. that's Isn't that kind of how it works? Yeah. Anyway, so I read through this real long thing, and then I was like, well, it it really is not conclusive either way. So I will let you, the listener, dig deeper into that and see what you think. Do you think it's... Ralphie, get out of the garbage! Do you think it's <laughs> the film that caused it? You're a bad dog. You're a bad dog. You'll be a bad dog. You stay out of the garbage. You'll be in a very bad dog, Ralphie. Well, lay down. Stay here. Okay. He's listening. Yeah. Um, Come here, baby. Bye. Okay, and then we get to into 1955. Going into the January of 1955, do you want to know what the uh, top song in the Billboard chart was? Sure. By the Cordettes. What is it? Mr. Sandman. Oh, bring, bring me a dream. I can't sing right now. My voice is too hoarse. Make him the cutie that <laughs> I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. But that's the perfect 1955 song. Like if you're going to do yes. a movie in 1955, that would you be open it with that song. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then January 7th, 1955, Marianne Anderson becomes the first African American opera singer to perform with the New York Metropolitan Opera. Yeah. Yes. Oh, gosh. Is that you? Yeah, yeah that I keep me. hearing that. And it's usually me that has that sound coming in their body because I'm drinking beers. But that didn't come from me. Sorry. And then January 18th, we have our first birthday. So Matt Truman Ego Trip oh, hit the go. birthday theme song because Amy hates them. Amy, Amy hates birthdays. Amy hates birthdays. A young man was born. Mm-hmm. On January 18th, 1955, in Linwood, California, and he grew up in Compton, California. He's the youngest of three boys, the second of whom died at birth. Okay. His mother, Sharon Ray, was a welfare worker, and his father, William Costner, was an electrician and later a utilities executive. Kevin of Costner. Southern California Edison. Edison. Yes. God. Kevin Costner. Oh, my God. We talked about, we talked about, about him on the first five episode. Five years ago. The first episode of American Timelines. And we both hate him. He was not academic, but this might make you like him more. Let me just try to see if I can make you like him more. I don't know if I hate him. Well, we hate, we don't like his acting. Yeah. I think we said we hated him. Enough. Anyway, well, really? he was not academically inclined in school, but he did enjoy sports, especially football. He took piano lessons, he wrote poetry, and he sang in the First Baptist Choir. He has stated that a viewing of the 1963 film How the West Was Won at the age of seven had formed his childhood. Mm. He is described spending his teenage years in different parts of California as his father's career progressed as a period when he lost a lot of confidence, having to make new friends often. Poor mm. Kevin Costner. He lived in Ventura, then in Visalia. He attended Mount Whitney High School, where he was in the marching band. Uh, following a move to Orange County, Costner graduated from Villa Park High School in 1973. The school mascot is the Spartan. And its colors are black, silver, and Columbia blue. Mm-hmm. Notable alumni include Rebecca Black. Oh, God. That Friday, is not a notable Friday. alumni. Gotta get down on Friday. Did you know Rebecca Black? I've been keeping tabs on her. She is a lesbian now. Oh, she is. Yeah. Okay. And she's kind of a funky look. You know, she doesn't give a fuck. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if she makes music or anything. I'm but... a little concerned that you're keeping tabs on her. Well, I'm not really keeping tabs. <laughs> What you said. <laughs> Maybe I am. No, but every once in a while you want to know. Like it doesn't. Nobody seem like... wants to know. You just you. It seems like just yesterday she was still in high school singing that Friday song, but yeah. she's now an adult, and she said she was bullied mercilessly. Yeah, I'm sure because it was awful. It was a terrible. Song. Oh God, her. It, she can't sing at all. It's a guy's fault. Anyway, no. But you now know, listeners, that Rebecca Black, who sings that awful Friday song, went to the same high school <laughs> as Kevin, Kevin Costner, Costner, and you'll never forget it. He earned a B.A. in marketing and finance from California State University, Fullerton, 1978. And while at CSUF, he became a brother in the Delta Chi fraternity. Okay, here's the part that was interesting to me about Kevin Costner. Okay? Mm-hmm. He became interested in acting and dancing while his last year of college. And upon graduation, he married Cindy Silva, who worked at Disneyland as Cinderella. The couple honeymooned in Porta Vallarta. Mm-hmm. On the return plane journey, they had a chance encounter with actor Richard Burton. Oh. You know who that is? Yeah. He was married to Elizabeth Taylor. And was his notable acting credit. Well, he was in um, he had one Cleopatra one. with Elizabeth Taylor. There you go. And he married her. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Richard Burton had purchased all the seats around him for solitude. And Burton agreed to speak to Costner after he finished reading his book. Mm. So Costner, who had been taking acting classes but had not told his wife about his desire to be an actor, watched Burton closely and approached when Burton gestured. All on his plane. Costner told Burton that he would prefer to avoid the drama that followed Burton and asked if he would have to tolerate that if he became an actor. Burton replied, you have blue eyes. I have blue eyes. I think you'll be fine. He was probably hammered. After the plane landed, Burton's limousine pulled up to the curb where Costner and his wife were waiting for a taxi. Burton wished Costner good luck, and the two never met again. Hmm. But Costner credits Burton with partially contributing to his career. Having agreed to undertake a job as a marketing executive, Costner began taking acting lessons five nights a week then because of Burton with the support of his wife. And his marketing job lasted 30 days, and he took work, which- Can I interrupt you really quick? Yeah. Do we really have to go through the entire biography of (laughs) Kevin Costner right now? Are you really kidding me right now? (laughs) 
I don't know why I continue to read this. I don't know why either. Okay, one more thing about Kevin No Costner. more. He made his film debut in a film called Sizzle Beach USA, which you can watch clips online, and I think it might be a porno based on the acting. Sizzle Beach. Sizzle Beach USA. Nice. Uh, as as distinguished from Sizzle Beach Europe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually originally known as Hot Malibu Summer, uh, and it seems, if you watch the acting in it, it seems like a porn. Okay. So- it kind of reminds me of the show I wanted to do, where like I want to take porn movies and take out mm. all the nudity, yeah, and all the porn parts, and just just the acting part, yeah, and have a film festival. Of Did somebody just, order a pizza? Yeah, yeah like this terrible thing like that. <laughs> uh, I bet it'd be great. Anyway, January nineteenth, nineteen fifty-five, Scrabble debuts on the board game market. Nice. The same day that the first ever presidential news conference was filmed for TV by Dwight D. Eisenhower. Oh. And then on January 22nd, we've got a new number one song on the Billboard charts, Let Me Go Lover by Joan Webber. Do you know how that goes? I do not. Uh, I was hoping you'd sing it for me. I can't sing right it's, now. I li- listened to it. I, it's not good. And then we got one more birthday before Amy jumps in here. And this, I think, might be it for January birthdays. Um, and this one's really interesting, too, I think. I'll be the judge of that. Born, <laughs> You will be the judge. A harsh critic judge of that. Born in Amsterdam, Netherlands, Edward Lodvik was a son of Jan Van Halen and Eugenia Eugenia Van Beers. Eddie Van Halen. Yes. Okay. Did you know that he was born in Amsterdam? No. Uh, Jan, his dad was a Dutch jazz pianist, clarinetist, and saxophonist, and Eugenia was an Indo-Eurasian from on the island of Java in the Dutch East Indies. The family eventually settled in Nijmegen, Netherlands. After experiencing mistreatment for their mixed race relationship in the 50s, the parents moved the family to the U.S. in 1962. Eddie Van Halen's mixed race? I guess. Wow. Uh, They settled near other family members in Pasadena, California, where Eddie and his brother Alex attended a segregated elementary school. Since the boys did not speak English as a first language, they were considered minorities, and they experienced bullying by white students. However, the brother still managed to learn piano starting at age six, and they commuted from Pasadena to the San Pedro to study with an elderly piano teacher, Stasis Calvitis, who, who made up all the words for hot for teacher. What? <laughs> okay, You're making that, that up. Happen. Anyway, Eddie Van Halen never... Learned to read music and said he would watch recitals of Bach or Mozart and improvise. How about that? No, oh, he's pretty good. Anyway, originally he had a drum set and Alex didn't, and uh, but Alex was so good at it that Eddie gave him his drum set and then learned to play guitar. Uh, so there you go. That's there how. Go. And they formed their first band with three other boys, called themselves the Broken Combs, performing at lunchtime at Hamilton Elementary School in Pasadena when he was in the fourth grade. Huh. He would later cite this performance as a key to his desire to become a professional musician. Uh, Eddie said in 2015, we came here with approximately $50 on a piano and we didn't speak the language. Now look where we are. If that's not the American dream, what the fuck is? Word. Plus Valerie Bertinelli. Right. She was the hottest thing going. Okay, are you done? Yep. That brings us to January 27th, 1955, where Amy is going to take us on a crazy journey of murder and mayhem and sadness and rapes. I'm going to talk about the murder of Serge Rubenstein. Serge Rubenstein, y'all. Or Rubenstein. Rubenstein I don't know. Rubenstein or Rubenstein. Might be one of the two. But Serge is the first name. I didn't know how that was pronounced either. I had to look that up. You had to look it up. It's definitely Serge. Well, how is it spelled? S-E-R-G-E. Oh, S E R G. So yeah, that would be. Yeah, and so. Well, um, what else could it be? I guess the Carriage. I got a, I got a lot of this from the New York Daily News by Robert Dominguez. New article. York Daily News shout out but to Robert Dominguez. But there was also Dominguez. Wikipedia, and then Wikipedia um, has a lot of other. There was another one, and I can't remember. I forgot to write it down. Anyway, well, that's not good. Um, that's this not this terrible. New York Daily News. It started with um, this quote that was good. He was an infamous and he, oh, sorry. Let me start again. He was an infamous swindler, a scallywag, and an all around scoundrel. And those were among the nicer things people had to say about Serge Rubenstein. Wow, that's the nice things they said. Yeah. Whoa. 
So when the millionaire Manhattan playboy and convicted draft dodger met a grisly demise at the hands of an unknown assailant in the wee hours of January 27, 1955, it wasn't easy to find anyone among the friends, foes, and floozies in his vast social circle who were genuinely saddened by the news <laughs> or surprised. Nobody was saddened or surprised? No. Not even the floozies? No. Not even the floozies give a shit about you. So uh, Ruben Stein was 46 when he was found dead on the bedroom floor of his Fifth Avenue mansion oh, in Overlook Central Park. Oh, He had expensive silk pajamas on, his wrists and ankles were bound with cord, and his mouth was covered with adhesive tape. The cause of death was manual strangulation, and whoever squeezed the life out of him had choked him hard enough to break two bones in his throat. Whoa. The room had also been ransacked, with dresser drawers pulled out. Rubenstein's clothes were tossed around and the bed in, was in disarray. So the bedroom looked like our daughter's bedroom all the time. Right, correct. All signs pointed to a robbery gone wrong, and neither the cops, the papers, or those who knew the victim, well, were having it. Rubenstein had made way too many enemies for such a simple motive, uh. and his sensational death instantly sparked a massive NYPD investigation really? into one of the city's most intriguing whodunits. Really? I he like was all over all the papers. All over the society and columns and the gossip magazines and stuff. All right. Who knows whether the culprit was a jilted lover, a jealous husband, or an angry business competitor. But one Rubenstein pal had his own theory. Okay. I bet it was a mob job, a syndicate job, and a paid killing, stockbroker Ooh. Stanley T. Stanley told reporters, adding that Rubenstein Wait, had recently been threatened. St- the guy's name is Stanley T. Stanley? Yes, it is. <laughs> Stan Stanley. Yep. That's kind of cool. The man had many enemies, but he was not fearful. He was the type who never worried about violence. It was another part of what he said. Okay. So newspaper readers were already well-versed in Rubenstein's colorful history and shady exploits long before he was killed. He was always in the society. Remember, uh, what was her name? Dorothy Kilgallen. Dorothy Kilgallen. We've talked with her a bunch about of times. Her a lot. And she was. She wrote about Serge Rubenstein a lot. What's crazy is our daughter is getting into true crime. I guess because she watched something about Dorothy Kilgallen. No, she, she watched. She watched Dorothy Puente. Oh, that's right. It's different. That's right. Sorry. That's okay. Dorothy. There's a lot of Dorothy murder. That's right. People. Um. So Serge Rubenstein was born in Russia. Educated in England, and his father was said to have been a financial advisor to Tsar Nicholas II and Rasputin. Wow. By the time Rubenstein emigrated to the U.S. on a forged Portuguese passport, no no less. You know what? I have a forged Portuguese passport, too. Yeah, I know. I know you do. Everybody does. have that up on the dresser. Yep. He had parlayed his natural grasp of economics and thirst for risk-taking into a small fortune by buying and offloading distressed companies. Okay. Oh, and manipulating foreign currencies, which wasn't exactly legal. Wow. Well, his money- I bet that's- I bet that's- I, I bet- Never mind. I would say that's- Is that probably easier to forge than American back then? Like, oh, maybe. Maybe nobody I knows. Know. I don't know. I don't know. Why While his remember. money bought him friends in high places- his campaign con- contributions earned him a dinner at the White House with the Roosevelts. Wow. He became a target of the feds due to his constant attempts to evade the military draft during oh, World War II. Draft, convicted draft, he was a Dodger. You said, yeah. He claimed that he was the sole support for seven dependents with only a relatively low income. But he had married in 1941 to Lorette Kilborn, and they had two children, oh. Alexandria and Diana, which was, was the actual truth. Well, I hope those kids are doing okay now. He also claimed that he worked for Vital Defense Industries. Later, he claimed as a Portuguese citizen from a neutral country that he could not serve in the United States Armed Forces. Oh. He was indicted for lying about his income to the draft board when he claimed he only earned $11,000 in 1940, but actually earned $337,000. Oh, my gosh. That's a big difference. Yes. <laughs> the high-living financier. Especially at that time, $330,000 in 1955? Yep. That's equal to $1 80, billion. Dollars. $89 kajillion. Yeah, so... Uh, he was finally convicted in 1947, and he served two years in a Pennsylvania prison, during okay. which time his wife divorced him and the government began building a deportation case that would dog Ooh. him for the rest of his life. A deportation case that dogged him for the rest of his life. He was also indicted for stock fraud in 1949, but was oh. acquitted. So huh. the notoriety and his reputation as a big spender who loved the nightlife made him a, the like a D-list celebrity. Oh, really? So in he New was- York. 
He was pretty well known. Then. Yeah, he spent okay. his days cutting deals and his nights squiring a bevy of young beauties in the final <laughs> finest restaurants and nightclubs in town. Is that your words? No. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't unusual for Rubenstein to open the morning paper and see himself on the gossip page wearing a sharp tux and sharing a bottle of champagne with some beautiful woman of the hour. Man, beautiful women are attracted to this guy. It was, in fact, how he had spent the last night of his life. Oh. So that night. Out with the ladies partying it up? Yep. After dinner Jack and dancing Daniels. at a nearby club. Rubenstein took his date, which was a pretty brunette model named Estelle Gardner, oh. back to his six-story house on 5th and 62nd Street for a nightcap at about okay. 1 a.m. Okay. Gardner told cops she left about a half hour later and took a cab home. Uh-oh. Rubenstein then slipped into his dark blue pajamas okay. and called Patricia Ray, a secretary he had been seeing regularly, okay. but she refused to come over. Wow. That was the last anyone heard from Rubenstein. Uh-oh. At 8 a.m., his butler found the body. And a squad of 50 detectives interviewed more than 500 of the victim's friends and acquaintances over the next several days in what quickly proved to be a frustrating case. Huh. There was no forced entry in the six-story mansion, which Rubenstein shared with his 78-year-old mother and 82-year-old aunt, huh. both of whom <laughs> lived in upstairs floors. Those two old ladies lived mm-hmm. upstairs? Several servants lived in the house, including the butler, but they hadn't seen or heard anything. The butler did it. The butler did it. Rubenstein's mother and aunt claimed that they had seen a mysterious girl dressed in brown on the stairway at about 1 a.m. after hearing quarreling. However, that was before Rubenstein had arrived home, and police thought they were confused about the time and had seen an ambulance attendant. They are old, old ladies. And then another thing complicating the investigation was that Rubenstein had given keys to the house to numerous girlfriends and business associates. Oh, man, that's not good for him. Yeah. The Daily News, of course, went with a hot angle and focused on his supposed harem. Quiz beauties and strangling of Rubenstein, the cover wow. headline blared, accompanied by photos of his enjoying the good life with two young women. At least five girlfriends, including Gardner and Ray, were brought in for questioning. A parade of pretties, as the news put it. <laughs> <laughs> but police knew there was no way a woman could have yanked the stocky Rubenstein out of bed, tied him up, and then choked him to death. At least not without help. So attention soon turned to two shady businessmen who had recent run-ins with Rubenstein. Yeah. Who had complained to cops after being assaulted on the streets by strangers and having rocks thrown through his window. But both men had solid alibis for that night. So just as the case was growing cold, nearly a month after the murder, cops, acting on a tip, picked picked up a, pr- a petty thief named Herman Schultz, who came up with a whopper of a tale that promised to solve the mystery. So Schultz, who was 50, said he had been plotting to kidnap Mafia Kingpin Frank Costello for ransom, oh. but then switched the target to Rubenstein. Ooh. Schultz, who said he had enlisted several un- underworld types for the job, yeah. never followed through. But he was sure that the people he'd recruited were the ones who killed Rubenstein. Ooh. Detectives, unfortunately, came to realize Schultz was a bit off his rocker, and, the day, and then they were back to square one. So they didn't believe any of this crap. Yeah. And, but he was busted anyway for stashing a large cache of weapons in his home that included a machine gun. It would, only be, it would be the only arrest to come of the Rubenstein murder, which remains unsolved 65 years later. Really? And then I have this... To this day, it's unsolved? I have this, this kind of um, interesting little quote here to end. Okay. He sought beautiful women, those just over the age of 18, who had already endured broken promises and hearts, Aww. whose confidence ebbed to low tide, Poor who girls. contemplated leaving New York, or who might have left once and returned because home was even more intolerable than the numbing orb of cafe society, who, <laughs> at 22, had lost the whiff of innocence, where experience was a net negative. I would prefer to think of them than him, of Estelle Gardner, the woman he su- he supped with at Nino's LaRue on the final night of his life, of Pat Ray, the woman he rang up upon returning home, who later learned to her horror that Serge had tapped her phone to spy on her having sex with another man, Ugh. of Betty Reed, left a token few grand in his will despite her public declarations of love for him, who went back to Texas because there was no place else to go. Of Barbara Payton, who had a brief relationship with Rubenstein just before her acting career declined into the terrible oblivion depicted, deglamorized, and fictionalized in I Am Not Ashamed, which was a movie about Rubenstein. Oh, it was a movie? Of of Rosemary Peters, who days after his murder gave a press conference announcing her own brief relationship with Rubenstein, craving the attention and not comprehending its hollow substitute ridicule. Of dozens more, I don't have room to name, though. They should be named and remembered, too. So, really. Whose quote was that? Um, I think it was this Robert Dominguez from the New York Daily News. I think. What was the guy's name? Cedric Serge, Serge Rubenstein. 
Oh, it was S E R G E. S E R G E. Yeah. I thought you said C E R. Yeah. Um, so let's see what it looks like. Because with all these women, oh yeah, he's not. He's that guy, right? Yeah. He's not attractive. He's that guy. That's the weirdest thing. Is like power. Well, they're like guys. older. Yeah, he's like some older weird guy. But power makes guys so much more attractive. Like women love power, mm -hmm. and men like hot chicks. So that is the murder of Serge Rubenstein. Wow. Okay. And that is a wrap, I think. Right? No, we got February. Are you kidding? We're doing two months every time, but I only got a little bit. February second, nineteen fifty-five. The president, the first presidential news conference that was recorded earlier was aired okay. on network television. February 5th, the Fontaine Sisters, Hearts of Stone, takes the number one song. Okay. I don't know why I put these back in. And then February 8th, we got a birthday, Jim the Anvil Nightheart. <laughs> no, we're not doing that birthday. Well, at Newport no. Harbor High School, no. Blue and Gray, Home of the Sailors, he first no. gained athletic acclaim for success uh -uh. in track events. No. He was like a shot put. No. He had a shot put record, Jim the Anvil Nightheart. No. And Ted McGinley went to the same school as him, and Kelly McGinnis. I don't think all so. All right, we'll skip that. Jim the Anvil Nightheart's the best wrestler of all time. Um Anyway, he was in the NFL, played for the Raiders and the Cowboys. But uh, but he was part of the Hart Foundation, Jim Daniel Nightheart. But also on February 9th, okay, this is a birthday you will respect. On February 9th, I, the day after Jim Nightheart was born, in Casper, Wyoming, raised in Odessa, Texas, Jim J. Bullock was born. Oh. He went to high school in Casper, Wyoming at Natrona County High School, black and orange, home of the Mustangs. Dick Cheney was a notable alumni. Dick Cheney and Jim J. Bullock went to the same school. Okay. Anyway, are you a big fan of Jim J. Bullock? Um, I think I just know too close for comfort. That's the only thing I know him <laughs> from. So I don't. I wouldn't say no. Yeah, I don't know why I brought him up. I don't uh, either. Uh, but he received a especially because you insisted that you had important things in February <laughs> to get through Oklahoma Baptist University. So far, Shawnee, it's Oklahoma. been nothing. Okay, and. February 24th, 1955, the Golden Globes happened. And on the waterfront, Marlon Brando and Judy Garland were winners at the Golden Globes okay. in February 1955. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm going to say about January and February. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep making that noise. And our dog, Ralphie, is right here. And Weezy is here too. And they're on this podcast. But that's it for the that's first. That's it. We are now well in to the first quarter of 1955. Thank you, listeners, for coming along thank you this so journey. Much. Those of you who are still listening, thank you for listening through all There's this. There's anybody out there that's listening regularly. There, is. there are. There is. There's. I see the numbers, brah. There's people listening. What I don't know thank is- Thank you guys for listening. I don't know who you are because you don't interact with us, really. A couple of you li give me some likes here and there. But uh, tell us why you like it. Uh or why you're listening. <laughs> or, there might be hate <laughs> or listeners. Or why you're listening. There might be hate listeners. Like, I know oh. this guy, Brant Fundak, who he listens to, he watches WrestleMania, but he hates WWE. He just hate watches, which I didn't know hate watching was a thing. So we might have hate listeners, but there be. are people listening. Okay. So I don't know who you are or why you're listening, but thank you for listening. Yes, thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. It's fun to talk not just into the void, but people listening. But we do have s people that hate us. Like I had another guy say that he hates me again. He wishes this podcast was just you. Um, really? Yeah. It was some guy who looked up episode 75. I don't read the comments. That's what I... Well, he commented on YouTube, and he was like, uh, I looked up this murder that happened... Oh, in my you told hometown. Me I think you already brought this up. It was in Vegas. Yeah, I probably did. But he... It must really have hurt he your feelings. The constant chittering of me. Well, you know what? Could there be one person that says... That I'm obnoxious. Screw Amy and her birthday hating. Like, you are you have a voice of... I'm sure there is, but I don't butter. look at the... I don't look at the... No, comments. I do. Nobody says that. Oh. One person just comments say, Amy's not as good as me. No, you are great. Your voice really is, except no, for now. Right now, it's now that you're sick, good. it's not very good. But you do have a nice, calming, relaxing voice that I think you should look into doing a voiceover. I'll do ASMR. No, don't do ASMR. Anybody can do that. You just do this. <laughs> ASMR, there. You like that? Go to sleep. Okay. Anyway, thanks <laughs> for listening. It's time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. It is time to get out of here. Uh, I love you. Shout out to the Queen City Podcast Network. Thank Brian you. Bob love you. Shout out to everybody who's still listening. Uh, I hope um, Avec, if you're listening, what up?
Matt Truman Ego Trip is the greatest band of all time by their music. <laughs>